வணக்கம் வி ஆல் நோ தட் அ புட்டானியர் டிஃபார்மிட்டி கேன் ஓன்லி ரிசல்ட் ஃப்ரம் அன் இன்ஜுரி ஆர் இன்வால்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் த சென்ட்ரல் ஸ்லிப் ஓவர் த ப்ராக்சிமல் இன்டெஃபலாஞ்சல் ஜாயிண்ட் ஆஃப் த ஃபிங்கர் In an acute situation of injury of the central slip, we just have to repair the central slip and the treatment is over. But when the injury is neglected or the patient has presented late, some changes will occur in the finger in such a way that when we want to reconstruct the boutonniere, we must deal with all these secondary problems, otherwise we cannot get good results. What are the secondary changes that occur in boutonniere deformity and how do we deal with them? Before trying to understand the basic procedures in the surgical management of the boutonniere deformity, it is important that we understand what actually happens in a boutonniere. The root cause of the boutonniere deformity, as we all know, is the injured or attenuated central slip. When this central slip gets injured, the proximal interphalangeal joint does not have any force of extension to help it and so it goes into a position of flexion. When it goes into a position of flexion, the lateral bands that are present on both sides of the central slip will slip downward on the volar aspect to a point where they are even volar to the axis of the proximal interphalangeal joint now all the forces from the extensors are directed through the lateral bands to the insertion at the base of the terminal phalanx on the dorsal aspect leading to hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint the displaced lateral bands have a biomechanical effect also now they begin to act as flexors of the proximal interphalangeal joint instead of supporting the extension movement that is because they are now volar to the axis of the proximal interphalangeal joint these lateral slips are then held in position by the fibrosed transverse retinacular ligament which attaches the lateral slips to the fibrous flexor sheath also the oblique retinacular ligament gets contracted and this adds to the hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint the extensor apparatus or the hood as it is called is kept in the same position for quite some time depending on the time of injury as a result this extensor expansion gets stuck to the underlying bone which is the proximal phalanx This picture shows a classic boutonniere deformity with flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint. It is important to note here that the boutonniere deformity is well accepted if the lag at the proximal interphalangeal joint is less than 30 degrees. So why surgery at all for boutonniere deformity? Here we need to understand the basic principles as propounded by Burton in 2015 surgery for the boutonniere deformity must be done by an experienced hand surgeon and surgery is rarely required in a supple deformity with less than 30 degree loss of extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint if at all surgery is required the joint must be soft and supple in the range in which it is acting the surgery does not indicate surgery alone it must be combined with a good preoperative and postoperative exercise program if arthritic changes are noted on x ray arthroplasty or arthrodesis would be a better procedure in doing surgery for correction of boutonniere deformity of the finger we should never jeopardize flexor function to get back extension the procedures for correction of the boutonniere deformity can be either to increase extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint and decrease the tone of hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint so primarily we need to understand that the indications for surgery for a boutonniere deformity of the finger are quite rigid the extension deficit must be more than 30 degrees at the proximal interphalangeal joint the patient must be willing to undergo the full therapy regimen even the best result may have 
10 to 20 degrees of extension lag and surgery must be contemplated only on a patient who understands that there may be a little loss of flexor function in the bargain. As we have seen, there are two main aims in surgical techniques for correction of boutonniere deformity. One is to get active extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and the second is to correct the hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint. Let us first see the procedures to get extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint. The first step of course is to make the PIP joint passive range of movement full as far as possible. If we are successful in doing this or if there is a good joint space on x-ray, there are four important steps that we need to understand. The first is release of retinacular ligaments, both the transverse retinacular ligament and the oblique retinacular ligament, extensor tenolysis, tendon reconstruction and lateral bands relocation. If the proximal interphalangeal joint is totally destroyed as seen by a stiff proximal interphalangeal joint with no joint space seen on x-ray, the above said procedures will not be useful and it is better to do either an arthroplasty or an arthrodesis of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Now let us see the details of these four procedures to get extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Release of retinacular ligaments, extensor tenolysis, tendon reconstruction and lateral bands relocation. Release of the retinacular ligaments refers to complete division of the transverse retinacular ligament which is seen as fibrous tissue between the lateral bands that have slipped volarwards and the fibrous flexor sheath. The oblique retinacular ligament must also be divided to completely release the lateral bands. Extensor tenolysis refers to the release of the extensor hood from the proximal phalanx bone. This must be done so that the extensor tendon becomes completely free. Next, we need to address the disruption of the central slip. If the gap in the central slip is small, we can suture it if the distal end is available. If the distal end is not available, we can either use an anchor suture or we can pass a transverse drill hole through the base of the middle phalanx and attach the proximal end of the central slip to it. However, if the gap in the central slip is large, attempting a primary suturing will lead to hyperextension deformity at the proximal interphalangeal joint and should be avoided. It is better to reconstruct large gaps in the central slip and there are different techniques for doing so. The released lateral band on one side can be used to reconstitute extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint or both lateral slips can reconstitute the central slip itself or a turnover flap from the central slip can be sutured to the base of the middle phalanx to get back extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Other techniques like using a tendon graft or a facial graft using the extensor retinaculum or a direct tendon graft can be used. Reconstituting or reconstructing the central slip alone is not enough and it is important to deal with the lateral bands that have slipped volarward. They should be brought back that is relocated to the dorsum of the finger and reconstituted by suturing. None of these procedures will be useful if the joint is destroyed where an arthroplasty or an arthrodesis of the PIP joint is preferred. This shows a clinical example of destruction of the proximal interphalangeal joint for which a joint replacement has been done. Arthroplasty is ideal for those patients in which the primary pathology is in the joint like in rheumatoid arthritis. Arthrodesis of the proximal interphalangeal joint is a good alternative especially when all the fingers are involved like in post burn problems. We shall now see the surgical procedure of boutonniere correction for a two month old injury of the central slip which demonstrates all the steps that we have described so far. The dorsal aspect of the PIP joint of the little finger is opened by a cross finger flap like incision that is made based on the ulnar side. 
the scar over the PIP joint is first excised. Now the retinacular ligaments that is the transverse retinacular ligament is released on the ulnar side and as this step is being done you will make out that the lateral bands are getting slowly released. Extensor tenolysis is done to release the extensor tendon and the hood from the underlying bone. Now the transverse retinacular ligament is released on the radial side of the little finger and also the oblique retinacular ligament is released and excised because it is quite thick. Once this is done, we are able to extend the PIP joint passively without any restriction. The gap between the cut ends of the central slip is quite small in this particular patient. Primary suturing of the central slip is now carried out and it is also made sure that passive flexion is completely possible. The lateral bands that have been released on both sides are now brought to the dorsal aspect and sutured to the lateral aspect of the reconstituted central slip. This is the final picture at the end of the surgical procedure. Getting back active extension in the proximal interphalangeal joint alone may not be enough in a well-established boutonniere deformity because the hyperextension of the distal interphalangeal joint must also be corrected. The simplest way of correcting the hyperextension of the DAP joint is to do a tenotomy of the distal extensor tendon. It is almost like creating a mallet deformity. The use of this technique was first described by Dolphin in 1965 and there are various methods in which this tenotomy can be done to reduce the mallet deformity like a transverse incision proximal to the attachment of the oblique retinacular bands or a V-shaped incision, a H-type incision or if the deformity is very severe, tenotomy distal to the attachment of the oblique retinacular ligaments. We must also realize that the skin over the dorsal aspect of the hyperextended distal interphalangeal joint may be very tight. This can be released either by a VY plasty, making a V incision and after releasing the terminal tendon, closing it in the form of a Y or a transverse incision which is made in the skin, then the tenotomy is done and this wound is covered with a full thickness skin graft. We have seen many procedures, but Curtis in 1983 tried to stage these procedures in the following way. The first stage would consist of extensor tenolysis and release so that the extensor expansion is totally released. If the boutonniere deformity is not corrected and the PIP joint is still not coming into extension, division of the transverse retinacular ligaments as the next stage. In stage 3, elongation of the lateral bands over the middle phalanx can be attempted and finally restoration of the central extensor tendon by any of the procedures described. Following the post-operative protocol is as important as the surgery. Immobilization is advised for the entire hand for 4 weeks in a volar POP slab that can be removed at the end of 4 weeks and a boutonniere splint applied to the particular finger that has been involved. This splint should be applied for 2 weeks along with active mobilization of the DIP flexion as shown. This will prevent the oblique retinacular ligament from getting stuck again. At the end of 2 weeks of the boutonniere splint, we can start resisted exercises for distal interphalangeal joint flexion as shown in this video. The night splinting should be continued over these 2 weeks. Let us now summarize the surgical management of the boutonniere deformity of the finger. Surgery is indicated only if there is an extension lag of more than 30 degrees. Surgery should be aimed to get back active PIP joint extension and must also correct the distal interphalangeal joint hyperextension. We need to remember that severe boutonniere deformities are very difficult to treat and at the same time, mild deformities can be made worse. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. 
Please click on the shown links to see more about other zones of extensor tendon injury and their management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery.